So where we left it was that we've got ourselves now a fully connected network, so it makes no assumptions about the size of the input, the number of parameters we're going to have. It just adapts itself depending on the size of the input, which for images you can imagine makes quite a lot of sense. They change size quite a lot. But in most other ways, it acts exactly like a normal deep network. We've talked about this before in other videos, like uh, the Deep Dream one. But the deeper you go into the network, the sort of higher level information we have on what's going on. It's objects and, and, and animals and things rather than bits of fur and, and edges. And the shallower we are, we have much less idea. But the shallower we are, we also have much higher spatial resolution because we've got basically the input image size. Because of these max pooling layers, mostly, every time we downsample, what we're doing is we're taking a small group of pixels and just choosing the best of them, the max of them, and putting that in the output. And that just halves the size of the image and halves it again and halves it again. And you can imagine that if you've got an image of 256 by 256, we might repeat this process four, five, six times until we've got a very small region. It's done for a couple of reasons. One is that we want to be invariant to where things are in the image, which means that if a dog's over to the right, we still want to find it, even if it's or over to the left. Right? And so we, what, we don't want it to be affected by that. The other, the other issue, quite frankly, is we don't have enough video RAM yet. We routinely fill up multiple graphics cards, each of which has 12 gigabytes on. Um, it depends on the situation you're looking at. This is only one dimension I've drawn here, but it's actually two dimensional. If you halve the X and Y dimensions, you're actually dividing the amount of memory required for the next layer by four, and then by four again, and then by four again. And so actually, you save an absolutely massive amount of RAM by spatially downsampling. And without it, we'd be stuck with very small networks indeed. But we've got this problem that, yes, we've worked out the cats are in the image or something like this, but it's very, very small, right? It's only a few pixels by a few pixels. We've got a rough idea there's something going on here. Maybe we could just balloon it up, like, like a large linear upsampling and just sort of go, well, that's roughly a cat, but it wouldn't be anything interesting. So I guess the interesting thing happened in 2014 when Jonathan Long proposed a, a kind of a solution to this, right? which is essentially an, a smarter upsampling. What we do is we, we essentially reverse this process. Basically, we have a, a sort of an upsample here, which will maybe double the size. And then we, we look over here and we bring in some of this interesting information as well. Right? And then we upsample again and we go, oh, all right, so we can, now this is now the same size as this. So we can bring in some of this information. And when I say bring in, I mean literally add these to these. And we can have convolutional layers here to learn that mapping. So we can take nothing from here or everything from here. It doesn't really matter. And finally, we upsample back to the original size and we bring this in here using a sum. Now, what we've actually done is a kind of smart way of making this bigger. I mean, it's kind of, you've got to kind of try and get your head around it. But these features are very sure what's in the image, but only roughly where it is. These features are much higher pixel resolution. They're much more sure in some sense where things are, but not exactly what they are, right? So you could imagine in an intuitive way, we're saying, well, this is a cat, and down here we've seen some textury fur. Let's combine them together to outline exactly where the cat is. Right, this is a kind of idea. And you can use this for all kinds of things. So people have used it for segmentation, or we call semantic segmentation, which is where you will label each pixel with a class depending on what is in that pixel. Traditional segmentation usually meant background and foreground. Now, semantic segmentation means maybe hundreds of classes. So, so for instance, in the image I'm seeing here, it might be you, the table, the computer, the... Oh. The desk, the window, yeah, this kind of thing. And there's a huge amount of different applications for that kind of thing. So on a basic level, you could imagine just trying to find one object specific in a scene, so just the people. It's either person or it's background, we don't care what else. Or you could be training this on something like ImageNet with lots and lots of classes, or I mean there's the MS Coco data set for example that has lots and lots of classes, and so you're trying to find it airplanes and cars and things. And people do this on street scene segmentation as well, so you could say look, given this picture of a road, where is the road, where is the pavement, what's a building, where are the road signs, and actually analyse the entire scene. Right, which, which is obviously really, really quite powerful. The other thing is that you don't have to segment the image. Instead of segmenting it, you can just try and find objects. You can say, instead of just outlining where an object is, yes or no, why don't we try and draw a little heat map of where we think it is, and then we can pinpoint objects. So we can say, where are the two pupils on a face? Or can we draw around someone's face or their nose or their forehead so that we can then fit a model to that? So Aaron was doing this in his network where he was actually predicting the 3D and positional information of a face based just on a picture. 
uh, and you've all had a go with that. We've also been using it for human pose estimation. So where's the right hand, where's the left hand, what pose is this person currently doing, which obviously you can imagine has lots of implications for things like um, connect sensors and sort of interactive games, but also you know pedestrian tracking and, uh, and, and loads of other examples of, of, of things where it might be useful to know what a person is up to. And finally, we're using it obviously in plant science to try and count objects and localise objects. So where's the disease on this image? Can we produce a heat map that shows exactly where it is? Where are the ears of wheat in this image? Can we count the number of spikelets to get an estimate of how much yield this wheat is producing compared to this wheat? Right, and then we can start to run experiments on, you know, these ones are water stressed. Does that, does that mean this one's better? This kind of thing. So this is called an encoder decoder because sometimes what we're doing is we're encoding our spatial information into some kind of features of what's going on in the, in the scene in general. We remove the spatial resolution in exchange for learning more about the scene and then we bring it back in by finding detail from earlier parts of the network and bringing them in as well. That's the decoding stage. In some sense this is a little bit like a GAN in the sense that this is the generator here and this is the discriminator. It's just that you would switch them around. But let's not go, let's not over complicate things. And this one lit up which is maybe pause. And maybe this one lit up because here was a few lines in a row and this one is sort of furry texture or something, you know, and we're getting lower and lower level as we go through. 